Hey, welcome, Kim, to the podcast. Kim, you wanted to introduce yourself to the audience? Yeah, my name is Kim Leine. I'm a researcher in the cryptography group at Microsoft Research. And uh, my main work is in homomorphic encryption, which is some exciting, relatively new encryption technology uh, that allows you to compute on encrypted data. So I guess we're going to talk about what that means. Um, I'm also very interested in how privacy can be brought to engineering practices and especially new privacy techniques like homomorphic encryption, but also things like secure multi-party computation, which is another similar uh, cryptographic technology and differential privacy, how these things can be brought into engineering practices and how they can influence products and uh, services. Great. I think I'm, I'm really excited to have you because uh, privacy is definitely something now we're becoming more aware, especially as a, as a cloud company. Um, uh, so SMPC, homomorphic encryption, uh, these are the right tools uh, to look into it. Um, today, we're going to be discussing, of course, homomorphic encryption. So let me start with like a really basic question. What is a homomorphic encryption and how it's different from a traditional encryption? models mm -hmm. yeah so traditional encryption you can think of it as like a box with a lock so you you have your documents and you put them in a, a box maybe it's like a safe and you lock the door and you only know the key and uh, of course because the safe is safe you can store it in a warehouse for example long term and later you can retrieve it and you can open it and you can get your document. But this is not very helpful in modern cloud computation scenarios, because what if I have some data? I want to securely store it in a cloud storage. But then I would also hope that the cloud storage would be able to do some kind of computation on it, because I don't you know, suppose my data is some database and I, I want to, for example, compute the sum of some values. I don't want to download my database back and then compute those values. I want the cloud to have the safe containing my database and somehow still be able to compute that sum of values, for example, and give me the result. But somehow, at the same time, I don't want them to see my database. So this sounds almost impossible. But actually, homomorphic encryption allows us to do this. So the idea is that with homomorphic encryption, somehow you can operate directly on the encrypted data. So somehow the cloud or the warehouse the so uh, storage service provider, they can operate directly on that safe and uh, manipulate the data inside it without actually seeing the data. So the result of this kind of manipulation is remains like inside that safe and then can be returned to me and I can remove that uh, lock. I can I can open the safe and I can get the result, which is now uh, almost magically inside the safe. So, I mean, right on the screen, if you can see on the left hand side, there's a traditional model where like in Azure, you're storing your content and unless you basically decrypt it, you cannot work on it. In comparison to the homomorphic encryption, you basically never have to decrypt it. You're actually performing operations on, on top of encrypted data. Mm, right. So in this, in this diagram on the left, we indeed see that to, to enable the computation uh, on the cloud provider side, that's the red arrow in the picture, we actually need to give the key to the cloud provider so that the cloud provider can open the safe, compute on it, compute on the data, and then put the data, put the result back into the safe and then send the, back, uh, send the safe back to the, to the customer for uh, opening. But of course, this is a vulnerability sort of because now you're relying on access policy restrictions implemented by the cloud service provider to keep the key uh, sort of uh, secured and so that not every 
person in the company can just take that key and open the safe and, and, and get your data. All right, and on the right hand side, we don't have any key exchange mm. in a same way, basically. Yeah. Right. So in this case, we we have both um, that persistent cloud storage because uh, like secure persistent cloud storage because the data is in a safe. Uh, the when we send it over the network from the client to the cloud, we have uh, security during transmission. And also during computation, when the cloud wants to do something to it, something to the data, it can simply sort of operate on the safe itself. And the result now remains inside the safe. So the cloud never sees it and the cloud never gets any keys. And uh, in this way, the customer is always in charge of the keys. All right, so that sounds really interesting. It's almost like not possible, right? <laughs> like if you think about it from a traditional standpoint, right? Like how this is, and um... well, so so it it, it is definitely um, almost magical. I think people who have more mathematical background, people who have some abstract algebra background, they might understand that actually this uh, word homomorphic encryption it comes from the fact that encryption and decryption are ring homomorphisms between plain text and cipher text spaces and if you if you have some mathematical background this will make kind of a lot of sense to you and now suddenly it will be very clear that uh, okay that's how that's how we can do computations because these encryption and decryption are some kinds of homomorphisms this, they somehow preserve some underlying mathematical structure of the unencrypted data of the unencrypted sort of space and the encrypted space but yeah it is it is kind of magical it's a uh, it's surprising that this kind of thing is even possible yeah and i think uh, you know we are a little bit time constrained here but i do wanted to quickly call out that uh, there's a lot of like mathematical research that goes into it some links in the podcast resources so you know people who are interested in it can go through it one of the things that i do want to quickly talk about is the use cases with homomorphic encryption one of the first use cases that we started thinking about when we uh, started started our uh, our biggest homomorphic encryption project this microsoft seal library uh, was healthcare related machine learning predictions so suppose someone has a medical predictive machine learning model and I want to utilize that model. Well, I have two options. I, well, there's basically two options. I can, I can give my input data to the person who has the model and then they can evaluate the model and they can get the prediction for me and they can give the prediction to me. But another option is that they give me the model and I can evaluate it on my data and I can get the result. Now, in the first case, I lose my privacy because now I've given my medical information to the model provider. And in the second use case, they kind of lose their model privacy because they have to give their model to me. Now, in fact, neither of these options is very good. And we we're thinking that maybe homomorphic encryption would be a good solution to this because what I could do is I could encrypt my data my health data, send it over to the model owner who makes these health predictions, and they could actually compute the prediction on the encrypted data. This means that they would get an encrypted prediction out, so they wouldn't know what my prediction is, but they could give it back to me, and I could remove that um, safe, I could remove that encryption. This was the, this was sort of the motivating scenario for us from the from the very beginning and now we've expanded that a lot to other kinds of machine learning predictions on encrypted data uh, very recently we've starting started looking a lot into location privacy uh, because location privacy is something that matters to a lot of people it's very it's very obvious why that's uh, important for example uh, when when I look up some restaurants using my favorite phone app 
or breweries or coffee shops or whatever, what do I reveal? I reveal my location to the service provider. I reveal what I'm looking for. They know what they recommended me. So basically they know everything and I get the service. But what if we could, for example, provide such a location uh, based lookup service without revealing my location or without revealing what I'm looking for? And I believe these kinds of things are possible. Yeah, it seems like really high impact um, because there are so many use cases. I think the one that you mentioned, um, like a machine learning where you are predicting on data, which is encrypted, so you never reveal. The, did you, do you think that there are also challenges comes with that when you look into this space? You know, one of the kind of almost outside the technology is the, is the fact that um, for a lot of people, it's very difficult to understand what their privacy loss is. So when you use these kinds of apps and services, it's, it's very difficult uh, for an expert even to, to, to really comprehend what are they losing in, in terms of privacy when they use these, these kinds of services. And um, we are trying to, well, Microsoft is making a big push towards, uh, towards like responsibility in engineering practices and, and privacy, providing tools for privacy is one of these, one of the pillars of this uh, effort. And uh, in that sense, I think, uh, I think it's important that we create some tools for this, uh, for this kind of technology, uh, but I think there's a challenge in, in sort of understanding what you exactly get, like what is the thing that you concretely get because privacy is so hard to quantify. But this is why, for example, the location privacy is very nice, a very nice example because location privacy is something that's very obvious to people. So I think uh, aside the technical challenges, there is some kind of conceptual challenge in um, um, in like understanding what you actually get from this technology concretely. Mm -hmm. And but from a technological point of view, uh, there are challenges uh, of maybe let's say two types or three types. One of them is that. Um, using homomorphic encryption today is uh, not exactly easy. It is possible and we have created some amazing tools for, for using that, this Microsoft SEAL, which is uh, very, a very sophisticated homomorphic encryption library. Still, it's uh, normal, normal developers are not really used to computing on encrypted data. So there are some changes to the programming model. There are some changes to how uh, how you think about what the program should look like. And uh, it's very challenging to make things efficient. Efficiency itself is another challenge. Homomorphic encryption has traditionally been thought to be very slow. And this was definitely the case, you know, maybe five years ago. But today the situation is very different. We've made huge, huge improvements in terms of performance. But um, and we're you know actually making much, much uh, further improvements using say hardware acceleration going mm -hmm. forward. But still, it's not like unencrypted computation. Encrypted computation is fundamentally going to be slower than unencrypted computation, possibly much slower, mm -hmm. and. Uh, in that sense, if you think of applications where you're already uh, performance constrained on unencrypted data, then encrypted computation is probably not going to be uh, feasible. And third, uh, well, uh, challenge maybe I would say is the functionality. So it's not possible to compute just anything on encrypted data. You can compute some kinds of functions on encrypted data. And this means that if you have an application or you have some kind of service uh, doing whatever, it's not, 
it's unlikely to be the case that you could instantly translate that to some kind of encrypted computation. You would probably have to make changes to what the computation is and what it does. So there are definitely these kinds of challenges. The, the technology is, uh, I would say, just, uh, you know, getting to, to uh, I mean, maybe it's still in, still in its uh, infancy, actually. But uh, we are making huge progress. And, and with these tools like Microsoft Seal, we're making huge leaps forward. Let's talk about this dual seal. So what exactly it is and how to use it and the future direction. I'm basically, you can see on the screen, um, if you're watching this, there is this Microsoft seal gate. So it's, first of all, it's open source. So Kim, do you want to quickly talk about it? Yeah, yeah. actually Microsoft seal is some, it's a project that we started in 2015. And uh, this, the idea was that we wanted to create a homomorphic encryption library that is uh, simple to use. In fact, SEAL stands for Simple Encrypted Arithmetic Library. And uh, in some sense, this uh, simplicity of the API was uh, and still is a driving force and driving uh, design principle behind the library. SEAL is a low level encryption library. So it's not going to give you, uh, it's not necessarily like easy to use so that you could instantly find some high level encrypted functions in it. Like you have to build everything from additions and multiplications and some vector operations. But this is what SEAL gives you. It gives you encryption, decryption, and these, these computation operations on encrypted data. And uh, you have to build your computation from those. Today, it's kind of like comparable to writing assembly language. But one of the things that we're going to do going forward is, is create uh, tools that help developers use SEAL correctly and efficiently. Uh, the library itself is written in C++, and it has .NET standard wrappers. It comes with .NET standard wrappers. And uh, this makes it so that it's easy to, for example, build some Azure connected services with it. And one thing I really like about this library is that, that or the, the entire app that you have is the samples that it comes with. Um, so what I will do is that I will go into the clone repo and I set it up using the instructions on the, on the Git. And if you look at it, so we have, um, let me just get out a little bit here. And we look into the code now and we also, run some of these examples and you can probably talk about it briefly what's your intention is we have the actual source i mean that's where basically we are building it from and then we have uh, the examples here so we have yeah, a lot of examples here you may not have time to go through all of them maybe i can just i mean if you have any preference i can open one of them and you can quickly go through the structure and talk a little bit about it yeah you know you could open that uh, first one yeah, I should say some, some words about these examples and how these are structured. Typically, when developers start using software libraries, they, uh, they, they download them and they look at the samples that come with the code. And, and often those examples are very use case driven. You know, if you take some networking library, for example, it might show how to create some chat app. And, uh, you can basically copy paste much of that code and uh, into your into your own project and and get get some useful functionality this is not quite how seal examples are our idea with these examples was that we we realized that it's very important with homomorphic encryption to teach the programmer some fundamental concepts related to homomorphic encryption we believe this is necessary because if, if the user, if the developer does not understand these concepts, they're not going to be able to use homomorphic encryption efficiently. They might be able to use it, but they would not be able to use it efficiently. And there's a huge difference between these two. That's why when you look at this code, it's full of comments. It's, and this is just the first one of the files. It's showing some very simple computation on encrypted data. But most of this uh, file is actually comments. And this is, this is exactly uh, why it is like this, because we wanted to teach these concepts 
these fundamental concepts of homomorphic encryption in these comments. Uh, it's necessary to, in fact, I would say that for a developer hoping to use SEAL correctly and efficiently, it's necessary to go through all of these comments and all of these example files and run run the code kind of look at the output of the uh, of the executable and at the same time read through these comments the comments will re kind of uh, refer to the output of the of the execution and hopefully this will teach the developer much of what is needed to, to actually create efficient solutions using seal yeah, I mean, I'm just looking at it right now, and I wanted to clarify that the examples are available right now. We are looking into C++, but this also, like through the wrapper, you can also use .NET, and there are uh, examples for that. That's correct. So actually, we have uh, this. Basically, the same examples are for .NET written in C sharp, and uh, the comments are totally comparable. Sure. Let me see if I can bring it up. So net directory oh here we go yeah so if you look at one bfe basics you'll see that uh yeah there we go so you'll see that it's equally it's, it's a similar file yeah i mean the documentation here is extremely impressive it's like almost reading a book you know, I think that's, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's how you should think of it too. Uh, it's, it's necessary to read this book, in fact. Awesome. So how would we do this? How would we go back to the console here and run it? I know that we're recording right now and you just released latest version. So hopefully everything will work. Right. You're actually using steel 3.3 here. We just released this one a couple of days ago and it's a huge update from steel 3.3. 3.2, which was our previous release. Awesome. So if anyone listening or watching, they should download the latest one. When I run this, so maybe you can explain quickly what we see here mm -hmm. uh, on the screen. Right. So the idea, how, how you're supposed to kind of use these examples, like I mentioned, you're supposed to run them. And at the same time, you're supposed to look at the source code. So that's why we have this menu here and you can run these individual examples. For example, you could run the first one type one and hit enter so it you know it gives some output then you can scroll up to to look at that output then you look at you can at the same time uh, uh, read the comments in the cpp file now going going to the if you scroll down to the examples i'm not gonna go through this uh, output of these examples right now in this podcast that wouldn't necessarily make sense but i would I could say something about how these examples are structured here. You can see some abbreviations there like BFV and CKKS. So SEAL actually supports two encryption schemes. One is called the BFV scheme and the other one is called the CKKS scheme. These are, so SEAL itself is not like an encryption scheme. The SEAL is a library that implements two different encryption schemes. And these two schemes have slightly different use cases. In most, I would say in most use cases today, the CKKS scheme is more relevant. The BFE scheme is much older, uh, but there are also use cases where you have to use the BFE scheme. So the BFE scheme allows you to compute on um, like modular, encrypted modular arithmetic. So you can take integers modulo some prime number and you can encrypt those and you can do computations on those. But if you overflow that prime number, then of course you're not going to get an integer result back. You're going to get an integer modulo that prime number back. Uh, so that's the BFE scheme. That's the older, older scheme. The CKKS scheme allows you to encrypt floating point numbers uh, actually to be uh, very very precise and correct here it allows you to compute on some fixed precision uh, numbers but um, there's not really in practice like a, a user will take take some floating point numbers and encrypt those and then operate on that they can decrypt the result and they can get the floating point uh, output 
that's the CKKS scheme. And, and you can imagine that in applications like machine learning applications, you often don't need exact integer or modular integer arithmetic. You want uh, some kind of uh, rational or real number arithmetic instead. So the CKKS scheme is actually often a better choice. Uh, regarding, so, so you can see examples number one and four kind of uh, show you the basics of these two schemes. And then the other examples, numbers two and three and five, they uh, teach you, especially number three, teaches you some very important conceptual information about how SEAL works and how homomorphic encryption works. And it's absolutely necessary to study these things because otherwise you're not going to understand how, how, for example, CKKS uh, works. And if you don't understand that, there's no way you can use it correctly. What guidance you can give someone, like a developer, you know, regular dev with a basic computer science background? Where should they start? Mm -hmm. uh, they should they should go through these examples in the order that they are in the in the list here. However, some some like kind of word of warning that I would say is that when, once you start reading example number one and and you you see that okay, here's how we can do an encrypted addition or encrypted multiplication. Those, how it's done in those very first examples is not how you're supposed to do it in real applications that you implement. This is why the, like the, the kind of better ways are introduced over the course of reading through these examples. It's just that we're kind of taking this um, approach where we start from, from uh, trying to focus on like one single uh, conceptual aspect at a time and introduce more material over the course of these examples. So let's see what uh, we're doing here real quick, just to give right. them context. Yeah. So we start from here. So, right. so the, if you scroll down a little bit, the very first thing to do in SEAL is uh, create these encryption parameters. So here we have an encryption parameters object. It was uh, instantiated a little bit uh, up in the, in the code, but uh, it's this PARMS. So that's a SEAL encryption parameters object. And we need to set some encryption parameters. What this means is these are kind of um, parameters that describe how the encryption scheme works. And it's very important to set them uh, in a sort of correct or as optimal as possible way. Now, what does that mean? Uh, Unfortunately, it's not always easy to say what is the optimal, what is the best way of setting these encryption parameters. And there's some learning curve in understanding how to, how to do that right. Uh, SEAL does have functionality that prevents you from doing anything insecure. So it's not going to let you set insecure parameters unless you explicitly disable uh, that check. Now, if you scroll down, we're going to set a little bit more of this. We're going to set this coef modulus parameter. Uh, and again, if you scroll further down, for the BFE scheme, we're going to set this on line 121. We're going to set this plane modulus parameter. Uh, what these mean, it's explained in the comments. And it's, it's um, you know, it will take some time to, to understand and, and to get used to that, those, those concepts. But now that we have set our encryption parameters, we can create a seal context. So this is uh, line 128. And the seal context is a, is a class that contains uh, and, and that performs validation of the parameters, that your parameters make sense. And it also performs pre-computations. Now let's uh, scroll down a little bit. Oh, to create keys for seal, you know, public key, secret key, those, this uh, BFE and CKKS are actually public key encryption schemes. So there's a separate key for encryption, which is the public key, and a separate key for decryption, which is the secret key. And the key generator will create both of these at the same time. Uh, and now to encrypt data, we need an encryptor object, which we create here on line 161. And uh, for decryption, we have the decryptor object on, one, on line 175. And to compute on encrypted data, we need the evaluator, which is on line 
168 uh, up there. Right so there. evaluator allows you to compute on on the encrypted data. And we're really doing automatic here, like we're doing performing this, like evaluating. Right, right. So the uh, fundamentally homomorphic encryption allows you to compute polynomials on encrypted data. So this means that you can't uh, take just any program and, and run that on encrypted data. You can, uh, you can evaluate polynomials on encrypted data. Actually, you can do some kind of vector operations also. SEAL allows you to encrypt vectors of data at a time, and it allows you to shift those vectors uh, in encrypted form, but that's described later in some of the other examples. All right. So yeah. this is, yeah, now we are going into. But now you can see here, for example, encryption. On line 209, we create a ciphertext. And to encrypt some data, to encrypt a plain text, we use on line 211, encryptor.encrypt, input plain text, output ciphertext. And uh, if you scroll a little bit down, let's see if we can find some. Uh, Okay, we actually, in the very beginning here, we just decrypt our ciphertext to check that the encryption was correct. But let's scroll a little bit further down to see some encrypted computation. So here, for example, we do on line 258, we have a ciphertext mm -hmm. with this X encrypted, and we square it, and we write the output to this uh, other ciphertext called x squared plus one. And then on line 260, we add to that an, an unencrypted uh, number one. So a seal actually allows you to compute on encrypted, encrypted, and encrypted, unencrypted kind of data. So for example, you can multiply both two encrypted values, or you can multiply an encrypted with an unencrypted value. And you can also similarly add encrypted and unencrypted. This is happening on line 260. All right, and it basically give us the encrypted computation back as a result. Exactly, so you can see that the result of the output of all of these operations, for example, this squaring on line 258, it is a ciphertext, this x squared plus one, it's a ciphertext object. And uh, this, in, an, in a kind of a normal uh, setting, of course, here in the example, everything is in this one CPP file. But uh, in, a, in a real setting, what you would have, what you would see is there's one participant, one kind of party who encrypts the data, then sends it over to another party who does the computation. And then when that computation is done, the result is sent back to the first party for decryption. And the second party who does the computation, they, who does this evaluator that square, they don't have the key. So they don't, they're not able to understand what the ciphertext uh, contains. But they know that it come, it's a result of a squaring operation, but because they don't know what the input is, they don't know what the output is. Okay, so I think uh, in my mind, the way I'm understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, the actual computation, the square, is something that can happen on the server side, and they're never going to know because everything is encrypted, right? And they perform the operation on the data, which is ciphertext. Um, and yeah, they will send back to the client, and it's up to the client to basically decrypt it back, and they definitely have the, uh, the key to do that, the secret to do that. That's correct, yeah. All right, so there's a lot going on here. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot going on there. There's a lot of things like if you look at line, say, 270, 271, we are printing something called the noise budget. And, and you know, this is actually a very important concept also to understand, but um, it, it's like explained in the comments in quite great detail. And uh, as, again, this, is, this should be read almost like a book, not like something that you can copy paste from. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, computer scientists, a lot of developers don't have that much mathematical background and it's not, it shouldn't be needed. Even things like 
uh, you know, what most of cryptography actually, most of public key cryptography requires quite a lot of math to understand really, but you don't need to understand that math to use TLS. And, and similarly, our goal here is that you don't need to understand the complicated math behind this homomorphic encryption. Sure, you can like look at the code and you can see how it's being done there and you can find those academic papers that explain what's going on there. But uh, as a user, our goal is that you don't need to know that, you don't need to understand that math, but you're still able to use it because the API hopefully is uh, well designed. But the only hurdle that we haven't really been able to get around is this conceptual uh, complexity, because you still need to understand what, for example, the noise budget uh, means, which is on line 271. Like, what does that mean? You need to kind of learn that. And if you don't uh, learn that, then you're not going to understand how it behaves. However, this doesn't mean that the API would be uh, complicated it's like a conceptual challenge yeah i think what what i am like for me personally when i'm looking at it is that that from a syntax standpoint it's not a problem i think it's very well laid out it's just understanding like for example you said the noise budget and selecting certain parameters th these are the things that you need some sort of like understanding before you mm -hmm. start coding it up i think cryptography has in fact a very uh, bad reputation in terms of usability one of my goals now going forward is to to work with uh, usability researchers to understand how can we make this how can we teach these concepts in a better way in an easier way and like we already have those uh, couple youtube videos explaining how to install seal maybe these youtube videos are a good way of conveying that information. I'm not quite sure yet, but that's definitely something we're going to try. One thing I quickly wanted to ask is um, the future direction now. So we have this today, this is available. So what we should expect in the future on this front? I would, I would say that um, there's two major things. One of them is uh, we're going to, we're putting a lot of effort into, into doing hardware acceleration for homomorphic encryption. And this might be something that Microsoft might release uh, in the future in some form. So what that, how it is exactly released or published is not really clear to us yet, but hardware acceleration is definitely a huge thing and it will make homomorphic encryption much faster. It might make it more difficult to use. And there's, then there's a question, how can we get hardware acceleration so that you know it works for all encryption parameters and it works in every case so that as a user it wouldn't certainly make uh, the usability of seal any any worse and another aspect is which is maybe more in the very immediate future is uh, is is uh, developer tools so we do need we do need absolutely tools to support developers to use this because it is just too difficult, it's kind of too difficult at this moment, especially the CKKS scheme is very powerful, but it's kind of, it has a significant learning curve. Hopefully those examples are enough to get a developer sort of over that learning curve. But, um, but even, even when you understand exactly how it works, it can still be challenging to use. So what we want to have is developer tools, maybe integrated into, uh, into some IDEs, uh, not sure yet what it's going to look like exactly when it's uh, released. Another, maybe maybe a third thing that I would mention is that we're going to see more examples being released, more programs, uh, demo programs, example services using homomorphic encryption, uh, just to show developers, you know, what is possible, and uh, and how how to do those things, how those things can be possible. One last question, and I know this comes up from you know the enterprise customers, the large customers. Like, what the specs look like? Like, what the maturity of homomorphic encryption in general looks mm -hmm. like today? If someone wanted to use it in production, mm -hmm. I would say that Seal is a production quality library. 
we put a lot of effort into into making it like very very high quality uh, from the point of view of the code and um, regarding uh, support there is today there is no like official support for this technology from Microsoft however for example on Stack Overflow we have a tag seal and and you can certainly ask questions there we're happy to help personally if someone emails us at secrypto at microsoft.com we're happy to answer any questions and help people use it uh, but uh, in some sense this is still in Microsoft research and that means that there is no uh, product uh, level sir like backing for this uh, uh, today all right I think one is step at a time yeah is there anything else you want to talk about that we have not touched you know I think I would just want to say that uh, for, for the developers who are listening to this just uh, go to this uh, seal uh, github repo and, and clone it and and try it out and, and let me know what you think if if uh, you have good suggestions how to make it easier to use how to make it work better in some ways uh, please let me know if you if you encounter any issues we're happy to take pull requests and uh, uh, stuff like that it would be great to have more community engagement using uh, well with the seal project thanks kim i really appreciate you coming in and talking about it i think this is a fantastic area not just like from a toolkit standpoint but just privacy in general because the 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 impact it's going to have on privacy is, is phenomenal so hopefully we'll have you back sometime later in the year and we'll talk about the sure. progress made. sounds great thank you Rossi. it's always nice to talk to you